In the third century BC, the victorious legions of Rome marched along the North African coast and developed the province of Cyrenaica. Today, in the Libyan desert, memorials still stand to that classic period. With the rise of Mussolini, Italian eyes once again turned to this province, and the dictator of modern Rome, aspiring to be protector of Islam, set out to recreate a vast colony on this site of early Roman greatness. Modern towns sprang up along the coast. Not the least important of these was the port of Tobruk, facing east and within easy distance of Sicily. After Graziani's brutal crushing of the Senussi, the Duce rode in triumph through the newest stronghold of Italian colonial power. On January the 2nd, 1941, this same stronghold of Tobruk, with its garrison of 15,000, fell to General Wavell's army of the Nile after a two-day attack. A month later, the enemy was swept out of Cyrenaica. Our forces, however, had to be denuded to fulfill our pledged word to the Greeks when they were invaded. Rommel's Africa Corps reinforced the battered Italians and our army was compelled to retire to Egypt. But if possible, one point had to be held, to Brook, shortly to become the symbol of our determination to strike a second blow. On April the 9th, 1941, the siege of Tobruk began. It did not end for 246 days. Australian infantry and British gunners dug themselves in and waited, not knowing from which direction the attack might come. A chain of minefields was laid around the town, ready for the panzer divisions now being brought up by the enemy. But from the beginning, it was an aggressive defense. These men did more than merely hold Tobruk. In the first eight days of the siege, they captured 33 German tanks, took 1,500 prisoners, and knocked 24 German airplanes out of the sky. An inner and an outer circle of defense posts were established in the desert around the town. Night after night, patrols made their way out into the rough country beyond the perimeter defenses, gleaning information of enemy movement, skirmishing, or capturing prisoners for interrogation. As they returned in the dawn, the men of the outposts were standing too. Within the perimeter defenses, the garrison settled down to a state of siege. Natural caves were turned into dwellings, and the daily routine of eating, sleeping, and fatigues was carried out despite continuous enemy fire. On two occasions, early in the siege, Rommel succeeded in piercing the outer ring of defenses and making a gap which was only closed after days of bitter fighting. of the siege, the harbour was kept open by the British Navy. The danger of navigation in these waters was heightened by the number of Axis wrecks lying in the harbour, souvenirs of RAF raids when the Italians were in occupation. Running the gauntlet of shore batteries and dive bombers, our ships kept in steady contact with the men of Tobruk. Supplies were landed regularly, and every Sunday, pay arrived from Egypt. An interesting sidelight of the siege was the daily appearance of the Tobruk Truth, known to the Australians as Dinkum Oil. Soldier journalists typed out their copy and fulfilled the promise of their defiant slogan, Always Appears. The 76th Day of Siege. And so the days passed, fighting, resting, standing to, 24 hours a day, weekdays and Sundays.
the 101st day of siege. Between August and November, the British Navy carried out a feat unprecedented in history. Quietly and without fuss, the complete garrison of Tobruk was changed under the very nose of the enemy. At night, destroyers slipped along the coast within range of enemy guns, lurking submarines and aircraft. They succeeded in taking the garrison of 27,000 men off to Egypt and replacing it with 29,000 fresh troops. British, Indians, South Africans and Poles. And what was more remarkable, a complete tank battalion. In early November, General Sikorsky paid a visit to the besieged town and inspected the Polish troops. With wives, children or parents still in Poland, suffering the horrors of German occupation, these men had plenty of reason to hate the Nazis. The 215th day of siege. Towards the end of the year, Maryland bombers carrying out patrols over enemy-held territory brought back reports that Rommel was massing his troops for what looked like a large-scale attack. With the constant arrival of American Leasland aircraft, tanks, guns and ammunition, fresh troops came to Egypt from Britain and the Empire. General Auchinleck's 8th Army came into being. On the 18th of November, 1941, the second advance into Libya began from the Egyptian frontier. Auchinleck's plan was to push forward towards Tobruk while the garrison there would break out and link up with the main force at El Duda, a long, low ridge seven miles south of the Tobruk defences. News of the advance was received in Tobruk and details of the plan were conveyed to the various units. Between Tobruk and the arranged meeting place at El Duda were many heavily defended enemy strong points, which were given nicknames by our men, such as Jack, Jill, Freddy and Walter. The first of these, two miles out, was Jill, and the success of the sortie depended on its capture. At dawn on the 21st, the men of Tobruk set forth beyond the outer perimeter defences. After the artillery barrage, men of the 70th Division attacked. The 70th Division was mainly drawn from county regiments. Essex, Bedford and Hertfordshire, York and Lancaster, the Royal Northumberland Fusiliers and the Black Watch. The 4th Tank Battalion advanced on the strong point with the infantry close behind. Heavy losses on both sides took place before the gallant Tobruckers could claim the first victory of the sortie. Jill was captured and 2,000 prisoners were taken with many guns and much material. fierce hand-to-hand -hand fighting at each of the enemy's strong points. One after another, Walter, Jack, Freddy fell to the determined attack by British forces. On the 24th, the tanks were withdrawn for servicing and repair before the main assault on the heavily defended El Duda Ridge. There, in the front line, fitters, mechanics and armourers worked day and night in a race against time. On the 26th of November, the attack on El Duda was launched. Tanks moved up towards the position strongly held by crack troops of Rommel's Africa Corps.
available artillery was pressed into service, including guns captured from the enemy. on the escarpment itself. The British troops rushed the last few yards of the exposed battlefield and succeeded in driving the enemy from El Duda. They had reached the prearranged meeting place. Tired men dug in to await the arrival of the 8th Army. When the attack was originally planned, the Tobrukas had said they would hang on to El Duda for three days, but after that would need help. The 8th Army, however, were delayed by a very stiff resistance at Sidi Rizeg. The holding of El Duda Ridge for nine vital days was probably the greatest achievement of the men of Tobruk. On the 27th of November, advanced units of the 8th Army arrived. Then, and then only, was the siege raised, a siege which has brought glory to the name of Tobruk and its gallant defenders. 